pray. It's okay. Good afternoon and welcome to this workshop on aspects of identity. My name is uh, Louise Bennett from the BCS, which is an international professional body for IT. Um, my colleagues are Mirzan Braig, Andy Smith, John Bullard and Ian Fish. After my introduction, um, we'll have four five-minute presentations outlining three key issues. The first of these is commercialization of the internet, and I'm going to outline uh, the Western view. Then Mirza, uh, the founder and CEO of IT Matrix, an information security company based in the Arabian Gulf, will outline the Eastern view on this topic. Governance of identity on the internet will be covered by John Bullard, the global ambassador for IDEN Trust, whose objective is to put the trust into identity. I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but I was told uh, to kindly ask you to switch off your uh, hotspot on your iPhones or iPads so the internet will work properly. Okay? Thank you. Did everyone hear that? Can you turn off your iPhones and iPads so that we can get the remote participants up. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, Ian Fish um, from the Chartered Institute for IT is acting as a moderator for us together with uh, her, his Azerbaijani colleague. And um, he'll be talking to people on remote hubs who haven't managed to get to Baku. Um, and I know that there are some remote participants online already, so I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome our remote participants. The panel discussion will then last about an hour and um, we'll hopefully have a good interactive session. Um, the panel session is being recorded um, to allow the talks and feedback to be transcribed. And we intend to produce another yearbook similar to the one that we've already handed out here um, after this conference. Uh, no points will be attributed in any of this uh, to any participant other than the panel members. The panel um, was organized by the BCS, which is the Chartered Institute for IT. It's an international professional body with about 70,000 members. It's apolitical and works to help people understand the internet and how to get benefits from technology safely. Identity management and assurance over the internet um, is one of the key issues facing everyone. If we're to have a secure, trusted uh, internet and all of us to get benefits from it, both socially and as businesses and government. Our aim is to drive improvements that are needed globally on this subject through the UN Internet Governance Forum. We want to discuss with you today practical measures for improving identity governance and e-commerce and service delivery in both the private and the public sectors. First, by developing clear statements of requirements reflecting the variety of very strongly held views from around the world. We want to consider how to develop valid um, incentive models uh, that match the requirements of people um, for identity for e-commerce. What would make various stakeholders, for example, want to participate in e-commerce? We need to understand how this might work across different jurisdictions and different cultures. And we hope that you're going to help us to come to some pragmatic answers to these questions today. Last year, we held um, uh, a similar workshop at the UNIGF in Kenya. And we started with a very conventional set of key issues that had come from a group of people with a technical background. Um, and those were citizens' rights and control of personal data, minimizing access and controlling privacy, registration authorities and ID assurance, rights and responsibilities of ID providers, and the balancing act of security versus privacy. We looked at the whole framework for identity governance on the internet and the complex topic of trust in transactions with remote identities. We looked at anonymity, pseudonymity, and attribution. Um, the most fundamental finding from uh, the work we did last year that perhaps won't surprise you, the proportionality between security and privacy or anonymity is both culturally and contextually a very sensitive topic. It's very hard to define and agree and very emotive. Proportionality will inevitably be raised in every discussion about identity on the internet. But I am quite certain that there is no right answer to this written in stone that can possibly be agreed globally. And that was amply demonstrated um, in a workshop that I attended here yesterday on security balanced against privacy. So the important thing is that we've got to continue the dialogue, but we mustn't let the differences of opinion between different countries, different cultures, different people prevent us from moving forward on the very important point of identity governance on the internet. So this year, we're focusing on a modified set of issues. The commercialization of the internet, legal frameworks, the effect on economic development of the internet, 
better use of identity for access to online resources and services, and the creation of a dynamic coalition. Panel members will be posing views and questions about these topics. I'm going to uh, kick off by talking about the Western view of commercialization of the internet. Now, over the internet, I hope we can all agree that you need different levels of certainty about who the other party is that you're communicating with, and you need a level of a certainty that's appropriate to the transaction um, that you are doing. And this covers a whole spectrum of problems. From the certainty that you've logged on to a legitimate supplier when you're buying your CD or you're buying your travel ticket to come here on the website. And that means you need to know the identity of the organization. To being certain that you're transferring funds to your bank related to your bank account. And that's a different level of trust for a different type of transaction. The key thing in every transaction on the internet is, is the other party good for the transaction? It's exactly the same issue as if you were doing it in the physical world. Can they deliver the goods? Or can they pay for the goods? And most importantly, bringing in the legal issue, what's the redress that you're going to get if this transaction doesn't work and something goes wrong? It's also incredibly important to distinguish between an individual consumer doing business with an organization. If you're doing business with an individual, you may need to know who they are, and you may require personal data to do that, unless you use a trusted third party as an intermediary. If you're doing with business with an organization, you need to know that the business is legitimate and has processes in place that means that the individual from that organization that you're dealing with um, has the authority to undertake the transaction. You don't actually need to know the individual identity of that individual in the organization. You need to know that the organization is the right one and has internal systems that are going to check the transaction that's carried out. However, as a relying party, you don't, um, you need to insist, you don't need to insist on the personal ID for the individual in the organization. We all know that there are a lot of different commercial models on the internet. And some services are free or below cost because there is value in the data that we as individuals, as customers, may give up when we're using those sites or services. And we should know that there's a quid pro quo, and that quid pro quo is usually targeted advertising. I heard a lovely description the other day from a blogger called Blue Beetle, and I don't know if he's in the room or somewhere remote from here. Um, and it was this. If you're using a free service, you're not a customer, you're a product. Now, I think that's very true and something that everyone should be aware of. And it's true whether you're dealing with a commercial organization or with the government. The important thing is to recognize that, to recognize that you're giving up something in order to gain something. You can't have your cake and eat it. There are costs associated with the internet. If you don't want to pay for those services and that um, access with cash, then you have to realize that maybe you're paying for it through your taxes. If you don't pay tax, maybe someone else in your country is paying for that for you through their taxes. Or maybe you're paying it for it through the aggregation of your attributes and your activities as an individual identity identity on the internet. Now, in fact, when you talk to young people, they mostly accept this paradigm. It can be a win-win situation. The individual can get subsidized or free services um, and access to information um, by giving up information, personal information about themselves and their identity 
um, that they think is of equivalent value or less value than the services they're getting. If you don't want your identity attributes to be used and privacy really matters to you, then I'm afraid you either get offline or you pay for your protection or you pay to understand how to protect yourself. Now, I'm not advocating one thing or the other. What I'm saying is that we need to make our own informed choices. And these will be culturally and, and contextually completely different for each of us in this room at any point in time and over time. We'll change our views on these, perhaps as we grow older. So <clears throat> does everyone need an identity or the same identity for everything they do? Now, we posed this question at all the workshops we did last year, and the answer was unambiguously no. From virtually everybody we spoke to, it was almost unanimous response. The ability to retain anonymity, particularly in countries with repressive regimes, in some situations is absolutely vital. There is no need to know the biological identity of someone you're playing an online game with. In fact, you're more concerned that they're the avatar that you thought you were playing the game with. There's every reason for people want to retain anonymity in some situations. And most people use more than one identity um, for different types of transaction. How I, however, identity assured at some level is needed for some transactions. Most importantly, it's actually needed for commercial transactions when you're buying or selling things. You need to know the counterparty will pay and supply the goods or pay the price. You may also need to know identifiers for some things. And this is becoming increasingly important as we have smart homes and online health takes off. You want to be certain that you're monitoring the environment and whether there's an intrusion in your own home rather than in someone else's. If you're a diabetic and your doctor is monitoring um, your blood sugar level remotely and automatically increasing the flow of medication, which is already happening in some places, you need to know it's your medication that's being changed, not someone else's. So things need to have identifiers as well. So managing your online identity and the identity of things or organizations that are associated with you is becoming a vital life skill for everybody. How can we possibly manage that effectively on a global scale with billions of people and a trillion things attached to the internet? When all the panels have spoken, panel members have spoken, there are three things that I would like you to discuss with us. Is identity actually legitimate currency on the internet? Is this the idea that the Can internet itself should be a human right? And I have two reasons for this. The first one is oh, it sounds like I've got a question for me from someone. Such a thing. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, but the second reason is that um, I think of this and then I ask myself questions like is electric? Well, okay, right. I I'm back online. <laughs> um, Second question is, can individuals have control over aggregating and data mining on the internet? And thirdly, do businesses and things need the same types of identities as individuals on the internet? I'd now like to turn to Mirza Baig, um, who will tell you the Eastern view on these problems. Thank you, Luis. I need to take this one off for myself. Thank you, Luis. Um, what I would like to do is to present to you or to talk to you an aspect from the eastern uh, side. And my talk would be more, you can say, in general east, but more specific from the Arab world. What I want to do is to highlight a fact that between uh, the west and the east, from multiple aspects, when we are looking at the internet governance or the commercialization of the internet, we are way apart, whereas we can benefit a lot if we really look closely and analyze the Eastern aspect. Because if you look at uh, internet security and privacy, then you will be looking at that in the Western world, the security and privacy 
is on one extreme, whereas when you come to the East, it's on a very different extreme. We are used to having being monitored, whereas in the Western world, you'd want everything to be more open. And it's already very open. So to go through those, I would just relate that to you by putting you putting in front of you some challenges which we face in the Eastern world in terms of when we want to do the commercial uh, trade or commercial aspect of the internet. There are two things really which we do. Either we are going to be trading services or we are going to be trading products. On the product side, we have huge challenges. Whereas on the service side over the past few years, we have come forward leaps and bounds. Now there is a lot which we do on over the internet, including the e-governments, all specifically if I talk about the Arab world, everything is now there on the e-government side. You could do, uh, do the transactions with the government using the internet. And a lot, a few other of the services like the telecom services or the airline tickets or the hotel bookings have all gone on to be, used, to be done over the internet. But when you come on the product side, that's where the biggest challenge is because we in the Eastern world, I've, again going back to the Arab side, are more used to buying products with a touch and feel, the tangible thing. And that's one thing which we are crossing over. But then we have other challenges. We don't have the real infrastructure in place for the logistics to manage the goods to go from one place to another. And not only that, we have some other on top of that, the challenges that we lack the legal framework to protect the consumer. So then from that aspect, trusting somebody who will ship something to me becomes a little difficult for me. Whereas on the same, if you look at it on the other aspect, on the trust side, if I can go to the next one, on the same challenges, the trust on the face value is totally opposite. We trust very much on the face value. When somebody says who he is, we don't want to question them. We just want to believe it. To ask somebody to give their identity or to cross question is like offending them. So you trust it on the face value. And this trust on the face value is going, when you go onto the internet, it's more like with the technology there, it has to be true. Anything which is written on the internet, anybody who writes something on the internet, you consider it as valid, as true. Whereas if you look on the same, if uh, the, uh, the aspect of people not really looking at their own prevention side, it's way different than the Western world. For example, look at that picture on the screen. That's a car being driven in one of the Arab world countries. The father in the seat is having the child in his lap and driving the car. That's how the prevention aspect is. We totally lack this. And you see these scenes all the time on the road. So you have this challenge, which is being, you know, the insurance has been forced on the people. Otherwise, nobody was going for insurances as well. So that's one extreme we have. How do we address and take benefit? Well, there are benefits also on the other side. The benefits, which some may disagree with me, are like the one acceptance of being monitored privacy is not so private we accept in our part of the world we accept being monitored why because we have this trust in the government thinking like the government is supposed to provide us security and accordingly they are going to be monitoring us we expect the government authorities similarly people when we have these kind of talks in the arab world people are looking not at the private sector to come up and provide them the digital identities to do the internet e-commerce. They're rather looking at the government to come up with a framework and they're making them accountable or responsible from that aspect of bringing uh, security to the identities on the internet. I can. So uh, with that, I want to leave you with these three questions to be taken in to the actual workshop, one being how privacy advocates would not go overboard in pushing the Eastern societies to be more aware of their rights. I know, very tough. Very, see, that's a different aspect. 
You look at it from the Western side, look at it from the East side also. Look at it how we look at it, and there is a major part of the world with that. The other question is, how internet identity framework can become e-business enabler for the masses in the East? There is a huge, if you look at the East side, the number of e-people who are getting onto the internet is huge every year, and it's multiplying many folds every year. So how, what can we do in this framework to enable the masses into taking benefits out of this quickly is what you want to look at. The third question being, what boundaries of internet identity would advocate advocates of anonymous accept? What am I trying to say here is the part that when we say the word freedom, there is a definition requirement. What is freedom? And the definition requirement can only be fulfilled of the freedom if we define the boundaries. There is no unlimited freedom. And we need to figure out, and especially when you look at the advocates like Anonymous, Anonymous is one of the groups on the internet who goes for anonymity or who goes after uh, people who are publishing uh, or protecting the internet or the governments which are having more rights on the information on the internet. But then what is it that the boundaries that people or advocates like Anonymous would accept is a requirement for the protection of the society. And with that, I will cross over to John. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, I come from the private sector and uh, by background come from commercial banking and um, particularly been interested in the topic of identity and the role of regulation at the nation state level and yet the role of intermediaries at the global level because whatever we may say about the eastern view or the western view the internet makes no difference at all whether you are trading in Birmingham UK Birmingham, Alabama, Bahrain, Bali, or Baku. It makes no difference to the next door street or to the other side of the world. So we have to build some form of framework, some form of trust model that will enable wealth and commerce to take place, wealth generation and commerce to take place. And particularly to address the second question that Misra referred to, which is how do we enable small businesses, wherever they are in the world, to interact with their counterparties in a trusted manner so that commerce can take place. So the Internet offers an enormous opportunity to do this, but we must bring some form of governance, some form of trusted identity processes into the picture to enable this to happen. So if we look very briefly at a few slides I've just put up, we'll put up, um, is that coming up? Yeah, so I, I look at a, a few things here on this slide. What do we mean by trusted identity? We mean having absolute certainty of who you're interacting with. We mean being able to check and validate that it is indeed the case. We need to know who guarantees the identity of the individual person. It being a real name, not just a number and to have complete trust to act on those instructions. And we need to have a complete and transparent audit trail of who did what and when, which brings into question things like accountability and transparency that are words have been used frequently uh, during this conference. And finally, we need to see el trusted electronic identity as a key component in limiting liability and external exposures. So there must be some form of liability management. If things go wrong, where can I look for redress? So those are the key issues that I seek to address uh, from a commercial, from a business perspective around the world. Now you might say, why is this important? Well, if you look at, again, this slide, you will see a very simple two lines between a buyer and a seller. And these are just examples of things that happen electronically 
between two parties in any transaction millions of times per day anywhere around the planet. What one needs to support each one of those transactions is some form of credential that guarantees that each party knows who they are and so on. So that is why this is important. And it's not just important to business to business. It's important for governments. It's important for individual citizens who are starting up their small business and so on. So this is a critical piece of, of a trust model which needs to accompany the commercialization of the Internet. The other two things we need to be thinking about is what aspects of identity are to be managed and who will be covered by any identity management solution. Now, on the slide, you'll see two inverted triangles. And the higher up the triangles you go, the more complicated it becomes. So we all spend a lot of time talking about technology. But at the end of the day, the technology is the easy bit. It will do what it says it will do. The human bits become much more complicated, particularly the higher up the triangle you go. When you look at the liability and legal issues, how can, you, how can we link together the buyer in Bali and the seller in Birmingham, Alabama, so that everybody knows what their liabilities are and are not? And in the right-hand triangle, again, you will see that it's easy to have identity management internally or within a community of interest or within multiple communities of interest. But once you get to multiple communities of interest across multiple legal jurisdictions, it can get much more complicated. So these are issues that we're all facing today. Now, again, without going on this slide in any great depth, the way that uh, we approach it at Identrust and with the world's regulated financial institutions is by way of the law of contract, the law of private contract. So we will have the equivalent of a scheme such as Visa or MasterCard, if you think of that in the 20th century, and you think of the Internet era, and you think of the joining up of payments with all other pieces of a transaction, you need some scheme, some method, some legal, liable, legal liability framework that all parties can sign up to. So that is the, 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 the thought that we have at Identrust, uh, that is why we operate this framework, which is acceptable in, I think, 170 countries. It is a private sector initiative, and it is based upon the law of contract, so that everybody knows what their liabilities are and what they are not. And from a government perspective, I would, respect, would, would suggest with respect that governments are not in the business of managing their citizens' liabilities. That is not what government does or should do. Government should make use of these sorts of private sector initiatives in much the same way as governments use the world's payments networks. They do it with absolute trust. So I put these thoughts forward for consideration at this conference and uh, I, that there are topics we've talked about this morning uh, and they come up continually. If we can have some form of global contractual structure through things like financial institutions, which are regulated at the country level, then it should satisfy all the different blends of government that we have around this planet. So thank you, and that's all I need to say at this point. I will hand over to Andy, if I may. Okay, so I'm now going to try and cover off the most. I'm now going to try and cover off the most contentious issue of the lot. Um, since we've been doing this, and we've, as uh, Louise said, we've spoken at a number of conferences uh, over the last couple of years. Um, security versus privacy and openness. Th this is a really contentious issue. We have a balancing act, and finding the right balance is proving incredibly difficult. On the one side, you've got national security, law enforcement, uh, actually protecting the majority from the minority. 
making sure that all the citizens in the country are protected from those who would cause them harm, uh, from those that would commit identity theft, fraud, and other, otherwise n uh, perform nefarious activities. On the other side, you've got the right to privacy, uh, you've got fundamental human rights, and in Europe you've also got data protection legislation, um, all aimed at protecting the individual. And in some ways, privacy and the right to privacy is about protecting yourself. Um, so it makes the balancing act even more complicated because some of the things that you're doing for national security can be misused and used against people. Some of the things you do for privacy can be misused. And more and more, as organized crime and uh, intelligence services move on to the internet, you're actually seeing um, them using the laws and rights that are being granted around uh, data protection and privacy to protect themselves online and using those laws to misuse the internet and use it against individuals and against populations. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, it's a very emotive subject, uh, as I found a couple of weeks ago. Um, but it's also, it's been an emotive subject for a very long time. We have the hardliners on one side, like No 2 ID, who fought long and hard against the National ID card in the UK, because uh, they saw it as Big Brother, and so they basically got it stopped. The interesting thing there is that identity card was being designed to be privacy enhancing and to actually improve people's privacy. Uh, we have a situation in the UK, for example, where if people want to prove their age, you get people using things like passports, driving licenses. So you'll get a young girl going into a nightclub. She'll show her driving license to the bouncer. The bouncer now knows that she's over 21, so she can go into the club, but he also knows her full name, her real date of birth, and her address. We wanted it so that she would put an ID card in a reader, put a finger on the reader to prove that it was her ID card, and green light she's over 21, red light she's not, not giving away any personal information. We've had a number of cases of identity theft. The most frightening picture on here is the one of the fingers. This was a guy trying to get across the Mexican border into the US. He actually killed a guy, pulled off his fingers, the actual fingerprints, and stuck them onto his own. So that as he came through the border, he put the fingers on the fingerprint reader and it led him through. That's scary. That's the extent people will go to, to steal identities and misuse information. But then on the other side, we do have the need for privacy. We need, have the need for anonymity. We want people to be able to vote, um, to be able to contribute, to have freedom of speech. Um, but we don't want them to be able to abuse that. Now, where do we find the balance? How do we set a balance? And more importantly, how good is good enough? These are some more examples. Um, we have a lot of problems with stolen identities. We have a lot of problems with online fraud. Much of that is caused because the root identity cannot be confirmed or cannot be traced. So when you're interacting with someone Either you don't know they're the legitimate person or they don't know your legitimate organization and one they should be doing business with. It is very, very difficult to get this right. From a sort of governmental point of view, if you're going to give someone a passport, you want to know they are who they claim to be and they are a national of your country and they have a right to a passport and a right to travel. In a number of countries, including the UK, 
we take people's passports away um, when they're naughty in other countries. And we don't give it back until they promise to behave themselves again. Um, if they're able to get another passport and travel on that, or another form of travel document, that breaks the system of control that we have. So, I want to leave you with a couple of questions. One of those is, how do we protect the naive for themselves? We have a lot of people going online, um, a lot of very young people going online. They're following the crowd, they're following what their friends do, they're putting a lot of their personal information up on the internet. It's being uh, captured, it's being stored, and they can never delete it again. We have situations where uh, large organizations, large companies are interviewing people and actually asking to be friends with them on Facebook or linked to them on LinkedIn so that they can see their personal information, so that they can see the type of person they are and who they consort with. And that is a really, to me, that's a bad use of per someone's personal information. Um, people are, people's personal information cannot be deleted. Once it's on the internet, it's there to stay. And people may do silly things in their teens when they go to get a job in their 20s. The people interviewing them can see what they did in their teens and can hold it against them. How can you stop people from doing the stupid things in the first place, like putting pictures of themselves with a, a traffic cone on their head sitting on a, on a bench in Glasgow, up on the internet? The other question is, will we ever be able to balance the need for security against the need for privacy? And do we actually need to do it the same for everybody? Can we actually have different forms of balance in different countries, in different jurisdictions, and in different contexts. And the one that's been troubling me for the last few years um, is how do you have assurance in remote identity? Whether it's a government dealing with their citizens and those citizens only um, setting up an identity online, whether it's a commercial organization dealing with customers, how do you actually have some assurance in the identity? Organizations like eBay, PayPal, Amazon, they seem to have got this model right. They're using the, you get a better rating as you interact with them and as you interact with other people. And you're building a level of assurance you're basically getting an identity rating. So, whereas the financial industry has credit ratings, things like eBay and that also operate the equivalent of identity ratings. Uh, is that a concept we want to use? Is that a concept we want to actually establish? The idea of identity ratings online. So, then with those questions, I shall hand you back to Louise. Thank you very much, Andy, and the rest of the panel. Um, it's now time for dialogue, and I'm just reminding you of three of the questions we had. Um, is identity legitimate currency on the internet? And add to that Andy's last thought about um, should you get identity ratings from commercial organizations? Second question, who, who should govern identity on the internet? Um, John has suggested that a practical way that already works in financial institutions is using a gro global contractual basis with um, institutes at, at a country level taking part. And the third question is, will we ever get the balance right uh, between security, the need for security and the right to privacy? And particularly, going back to what Azra and I were talking about, in the East and the West, the views are quite different. We've got to accept that and understand how we're going to, to deal with it. Um, we have a, a microphone here, and as all of you will know from all going round, we need to pass that round to people to ask questions. So who'd like to ask the first question? Could you take the... Could you take the... 
microphone to the gentleman along there. <clears throat> I can't hear. Is it on? Yes, I think you need to hold it very close to your mouth. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Taqe Jaman from uh, Qatar. Uh, my question is, what is the scope of this identity? Like, if I go, say, to a car forum, for example, will they identify me using this identity, or will I be, or do, or do you want this identity to coexist with the uh, virtual identity? Have. The scope of, of identity, you mean what areas do you need to assure identity in? Uh, no, uh, so you want to link identity with the real person, is that correct? In some situations, not in everyone. Okay, uh, so my, uh, my question was, what is your uh, uh, in, intended uh, scope of this identity? Okay. Um, John, can I ask you that in a commercial sense first? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, I if I take this document as an example, this, this is an identity document that is issued to me, by the, obviously by the government. The only liability that is associated with this document by the government is what is written inside that front cover, which is basically, if I get in a muddle, the Queen, bless her heart, will come and get me out of it. Or if I'm a bad boy, as Andy has said, the Queen will take this away from me. The fact is we use this identity document for lots and lots of other purposes for which, quite rightly, government takes no responsibility. So my answer to your question is that yes, of course there will be other credentials out there. And, and the sort of credentials that I've spoken about with regulated financial institutions issuing them will be used primarily in the business environment today as treasurer of Shell or treasurer of a small business or whatever else. Um, but but the, the point is those credentials have undergone strong know your customer requirements, just like the know your customer requirements that happened when this identity document was issued. So there will be different ones for different purposes, of course. Um, but the po my point was really to try to say to the audience that there are solutions out there that can address a significant amount of the commercial activity and the wealth generation activity, if you will, of the benefits of what the Internet can provide for small businesses just as much as the, the, the big global giants. Thank you. Could you pass that? Excuse me, can you help her with the microphone? Hello, oh, here it is, it's on, sorry. Right. Um, yeah, Kate Russell. Um, the, problem with visual, the problem with identity in the real world is we can tell visually, we can get an impression visually, and, and in the uh, online world, creating a false visual impression is, is incredibly easy if you're skilled at it. I would put a question to Andy, actually. You mentioned that companies like Amazon are doing a really good job, but in some ways they can be over heavy handed. I mean, I saw a story a couple of weeks ago where a woman had two and a half years worth of books, DRM license just revoked and deleted because they linked her account to an account that they considered suspicious. And she had no recourse to get that back. They wouldn't explain to her it's in their terms and conditions. They wouldn't explain to her why they'd taken that away. Um, and she lost her library, um, which she purchased. And that was down to an identity issue that she didn't have explained to her by this very successful company, um, which you know perhaps some there are some victims in that success. I, is what I'm saying, I guess. Andy. Unfortunately, this is the case with everything. Um, if you take physical identity documents, <coughs> if you take uh, the passport, you're stuck in a, a, a sort of a problem situation. There are only a few identity documents. Uh, there are only a few ways of verifying identity. 
When you come to get a credit card or a bank account, when you come to set up your account with Amazon, normally they will use things like your passport or your birth certificate or some other breeder document to initiate that new identity you're creating in that context. But it always comes back to a few documents. It nearly always comes back to the passport. You, you've got a passport, you can get a driving license, you can get a bank account, you can get a mortgage, etc., etc. So you can set up an identity with someone like Amazon, um, and that's then based on your, your credit card information and other identity information. Now, if you take someone like me uh, with a really, really difficult to remember name like Andy Smith, um, this probably won't mean much to some of you, but in the UK, Andy Smith is the second most popular name. Um, there are three class consultants that are Andy Smith. There were six people in my year at school called Andy Smith. So I have no trouble being anonymous. Well, I do sometimes. Uh, um, but the problem there is that quite often I will go to an organization um, and I've, I'm there for a meeting or something and um, they will mistake me for somebody else. Um, and this even happens with uh, government departments. Um, there's one particular government department that has me on their database six times because I've gone there representing different organizations over the years. Um, and the systems are, they're, they're good, but they're not foolproof. Now, I think it's, um, Amazon should not be allowed, uh, under commercial law, Amazon should not be allowed to take away someone's property and not give it back, whatever their terms and conditions. Uh, in the UK, that just wouldn't be possible. They would use trade descriptions and, and other legislation uh, to uh, regain that. Um, but it does come down to read the small print sometimes, um, and I've... I've been involved in a thing that's been happening recently on the internet that is perfectly legal where um, organizations are selling demonstrator products like perfumes and that and you can get this perfume for £2.50 just to cover the postage and you very simple form fill it in uh, they send you the perfume and what the thing is if you don't read the small print the small print says, if you don't return the perfume within 18 days, they will send you one every month and charge you £89 for it. Now, it's perfectly legal, um, but they're basically using the fact you don't read the small print. And with people like Facebook, Amazon, eBay, you must read the small print because they do have things like that. But also look at legislation and make sure that the legislation in your country will protect you uh, over and above what their terms and conditions are. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the remote participants now. Um, we've got a remote question there, and I know we've got other ones in the room. Thank you very much. Uh, somebody you know, David Williams in the UK, has asked a question. Uh, it came out of uh, Merz's uh, presentation, but it applies to all of you, uh, and that is said, yes, we need boundaries on anonymity, uh, but what are they? Clearly, financial transactions need trusted identities, but what about access by law enforcement agencies, security apparatus, and how does this vary around the world? Okay, Mirza, if you'd like to. Yeah, the, the aspect of this would be to start with by saying you have to have a boundary somebody somewhere whoever you are authorizing or whoever is supposed to govern that has to identify those boundaries at the moment the issue is when we are talking about physical boundaries we have something called the government which is defining the rules and defining the boundaries but when we go to the virtual world we don't have somebody defining the boundaries and this ties in also with the earlier question when you said the scope of the identity the gentleman was asking the scope of the identity still has to be that just like your physical passport is there and the whole purpose of the passport, like Andy was saying, is that somebody, if you get into trouble, they're going to be there to save you. 
not only outside but inside the country as well. They're supposed to be providing you or securing your rights and providing you the security. Similarly, in the digital world, somebody has to look out for my rights and provide me the security and be liable for it. So who will be, or what are the different aspects? I'll let somebody else let the... I know that John wants to come in on that. And I, I would simply add to what Mirza said, is that uh, you, if you have um, a local relationship, let's say with your bank, and let's use the, the bank as the, as, the, as, the, as the example that's been talked about often during the time of the conference, there is a contractual relationship between customer and bank according to local contractual law. <coughs> so whilst, whilst there, there may be an overarching umbrella set of contracts between banks themselves that, and it, that cross various borders, within a nation state border there will be a relationship between customer and supplier that is defined under the, the set of contracts which will generally be defined under the law of whatever country it is. So there is a way, there is a mechanism of having local contractual relationships um, with an umbrella global contractual relationship, if you see what I mean, using things like regulated financial institutions as the kind of junction point between the two. It, it's a legal issue, not, not a technology issue. Thank you. Um, I think there's a question here, Helen. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, Andy and I had an exchange about anonymity the other day, um, which is why we both know it can be a very emotive issue. I, um, and I was very pleased to hear Mirza because I began to think maybe really I have a more Eastern perspective on this, which isn't appreciated <laughs> in London. But I think I, want to, I think I want to ask Louise a very fundamental question, which is at one point you said, that the ability to retain anonymity is vital. Now, I can see that if you're a human rights activist in Azerbaijan, yes, you know, that might be necessary, or in China, or, you know, in a country that has a bad human rights record. I can completely see that. But for uh, a citizen in a Western democracy, I must say, I do have some difficulty in seeing this. And I, I might say so. I think there are a number of confusions. I don't think anonymity is the same as privacy. People can know who I am without knowing everything about me. I th and I think it's important to retain these distinctions. And also, in these, at this conference, a lot of people are talking a lot about what their rights are in different places. Quite honestly, I don't see how you can have rights without having a rights holder. So, you know, the right to free speech isn't just shouting anonymously into the wind. And even the right to vote, of course, we have privacy in the ballot, but we have an electoral role. We have a register. Only named individuals can vote in democratic elections. So I just really want to challenge this thing. Why do people need to be able to retain this anonymity on the net when they don't with their passport and they don't with their driving license? Um, I, I agree with you, first of all, completely, that anonymity and privacy are not the same thing. And I think, it's very, I think they're often elided together, and this, this causes an enormous amount of confusion because people don't know what they're talking about. Um, I think also we have to remember that you have rights and you have responsibilities. And I think there are situations in which it is perfectly reasonable to remain anonymous. There are situations, even in a country like the UK, where you wish to keep, um, you know, if you've been given a new identity by the police because you're in danger for some reason, um, then uh, you certainly want your privacy. You may also care very much about anonymity I think the real problem comes when you're dealing with the, what I'm calling the aggregation of, of data and data mining. It's very easy if you know a lot of attributes for a person to be able to, to work out very quickly who that person is 
in a situation where it's quite legitimate for them not to want other people to know. And therefore, you might wish to retain some anonymity. Um, uh, for instance, if you're an ex-offender in a particular situation or if you're a, 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 a battered woman, by, by all the attributes, there are people who can work out who you are and you might not be happy about this. You might not be happy about this in relation, for example, one example I heard that I think is very true is uh, a person who had uh, HIV and was working in a hospital um, and uh, didn't want any of the colleagues to, to know that, um, but had agreement that the work they were doing um, wasn't likely to cause infection to anyone else. So I think there are situations where um, you don't necessarily want uh, people to know who you are. Um, and there are situations, I mean, bloggers use, use pseudonyms because they don't want people to work out their sources. <laughs> you know, people say, oh, well, if he knows that, that, and that, he must work in this, this, and this. And maybe some of those people can work it out, but they want to remain anonymous. So I think there are perfectly legitimate reasons for wanting to retain anonymity, in, in, in my opinion. I don't know if anybody else... Uh, uh, Ms. Rupp. Yeah, I would just like to add that. If we are talking about the part, Luis, where you said that uh, it is it looks like it's really a security issue rather than anonymity issue because the person who would declare something does not like somebody to know it is just because they feel threatened by them but in an ideal world if there is ideal security then we can have that we don't really look for anonymity at that point so because we have those threats that's the only reason we require that anonymity Um, I think um, our remote moderator wants to come in from his perspective. Yeah, if, yeah. if you're going to st stop on this topic for a while of uh, anonymity, then uh, David Williams, the remote participant, has another uh, question and follow-on. But if you're going to move on to others, then... Um, there's going to be uh, another point response here, and then we'll get the response from the remote participant. Then I'll go to your question. Right. Um, I agree completely that privacy and anonymity are different. Um, the biggest issue I have with anonymity is where people actually abuse it and use it to their own advantage. Um, so being on the internet and being anonymous for the majority is fine. Um, but we need to be able to track down the bad guys. And this is where your security and law enforcement comes in. If someone is doing bad things on the internet and they are tr hiding, they're trying to do it anonymously, you need to be able to trace them. You need to be able to find them and prosecute them. Otherwise, there is no deterrent. And we've got more organized crime moving on. I know something that uh, Helen is very passionate about is preventing cyberbullying and these are things that we have got to address and we can't do that if people are going to hide behind anonymity but it is different to privacy privacy is about not giving uh, personal details to people who have no need to have them um, you may give your name you may give a pseudonym you, you may use um, some form of identity tag on the internet but it should be traceable back to uh, a root identity in most instances uh, but it should only be people like law enforcement um, or intelligence agencies that should be able to do that um, and on the internet people also get things badly wrong I mean because of um, something that happened a couple of weeks ago according to one website I'm a cabinet minister and I thought that that was absolutely brilliant um, you know I've been demoted to a minister um, it's it's but it's really amazing how someone will take personal information and they will either extrapolate it or they will take the bits that interest them or they'll misquote etc and You've got to have the protections to prevent that becoming a problem as well. 
if we could go to the remote um, participant, I think someone here has to say what they're saying. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's correct. That's correct. Um, David Williams followed up with the first answer that was given, so uh, it, it may already have been answered partly, but I need to get it across. And uh, he said, "Fine, we need boundaries." But who, this is in uh, not anonymity. Can you put it nearer to? This yeah. in the anonymity question. Um, but uh, how is this going to be, he's used the word police, policed internationally across very different regimes and administrations. He said in the commercial world, uh, you can impose restrictions and sanctions, but uh, not in other unregulated fields. I think my response to that is that's absolutely true. <laughs> uh, do, do, do you want well, to... I mean, all, all I can really say it, from, from my own experience is that, that, that um, regulation of things like financial institutions is ever, ever tighter. And uh, governments should be able to derive a considerable degree of comfort from their ability to regulate locally, i.e. within the nation state, but also by the power of probably the nearest thing to a global regulator in the financial world, which is the Federal Reserve in the United States. Um, to, to be a pretty tough big stick when it comes to uh, some form of global reach as well. And you know, the, the rep company I represent is actually a regulated entity by the, by the Federal Reserve, and so there's a very big stick hanging over us to make certain that we do our job within this, the, the model, that we do it properly, um, otherwise we're in deep trouble. Thank you. I would add to that, uh, I, I simply want to say that why don't we start working on one? Why don't um, the David Williams is asking oh. who's going to do it? Well, we should start working on one. Just like the countries are there, there may be governments or there may be private companies who will establish this identity framework on the internet. And just like I'm a citizen of a country, I'll become a citizen on the internet for one of those companies or organizations. And if I don't like one, I'll shift to another one. And between those organizations, they need to come up with a framework of how to work together. Well, I, I have to add to that that in the, in the UK, that is, in, in fact, we've given up the ID card, and that is what they're, st they're starting to do. We're going to have federated ID warranted by a number of uh, private companies. <laughs> sure, let, let me see if I can... Uh... Oh. Yeah. Let me see if I can manage the microphone. Yes. Yeah? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and hold this close because I know it yeah. attenuates. Um, as several people have said, any one of these issues of principle is practically worth a whole conference in its own right. Um, so I'm going to try and keep this very brief. Um, this problem is often posed as one of drawing the balance between privacy and security. One of my counterparts at the OECD the other week put it very nicely when he said, it is not a matter of drawing the balance. We have to set a different design goal, which is to optimize for both security and privacy. Um, so I think that's even more challenging than just simply drawing the balance between the two. But it's something that we need to try and step up to. When it comes to the anonymity versus privacy versus security debate, again, it's an emotive topic. Um, but my view is that, well, this is often characterized again as the if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear argument. My problem with that is that there are always bad actors in the system, even amongst those, for example, who have authorized access to data. And under those circumstances, the question is, who do you have something to fear from? Because it may well not be the people who are asking for your information. It may well be third parties who do not have your best interests at heart. And that, again, is something that needs to be designed into these kinds of systems. So just one other thing, and this comes to Andy's point about um, would it be better if we had identity ratings? Um, and I think that depends on your view of what identity is based on. I think if you have a traditional view of identity as something that you get in John's model, by going to a trusted authority and being issued with a trusted credential, then identity ratings can work. 
But if you take more of Louise's model, where you work out who someone is by gathering attributes about them, and you may not actually know their name, you may never have seen a credential, but you know who they are because you know about their behavior and their pa patterns of purchase and their location, for example. All the kind of data that is collected about us every day and which is mined by third parties. If that's the model you have of identity, then an identity rating in Andy's model won't work. What you need in that case is much more like a reputation score. So in between those two extremes, one, the trusted identity in, John, in John's model, and two, the attribute-based identity of Louise's model, there is this idea of managing reputation. And I think that's a skill which we will have to develop if we're going to manage trust in this new internet identity. Thank you. I think that's uh, covered that point really extremely, extremely well. And I think, again, reputation and trust are other very important uh, issues. And reputation is not only important to individuals, it's enormously important to institutions. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, my name is Alan Cairns. I'm a member of the uh, House of Commons. And my point builds very neatly on, on the last point that was made. Um, because the demands and requirements for, for and from individuals will be different. There will be some that are quite happy for the information to be shared. There are others that, that don't. And the market will provide a solution to that. Um, and the, I was going to make the point about a reputable organizations which, uh, uh, which has just been made because in the non-internet world, if you're going down the high street and you want to buy uh, a, a, a consumer good, you may well pay extra to buy it from a reputable chain where you get the guarantees and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the support and recognition, or you might want to buy it in the corner of a, of a market that might not offer those guarantees and support. And therefore, the market will provide. And when we talk about some sort of regulatory requirements, I just think that that is simply unachievable across the, the different needs of individuals, but of the different regulatory, regulatory regimes in different nations in order, to, uh, in order to guarantee it. And you can't compare the needs and demands of individuals in, uh, in an oppressed nation with that in a free nation. And therefore, I think we have to trust the market to deliver them. Uh, otherwise, we're, because even if there is a regulated system that is introduced, there will be people who will find their way around it. And uh, so, whereas I potentially applaud the point system that we've used, uh, that then again, there will be people targeting that and, uh, and seeking to score a higher score than they're, than they're, than, 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 than they're worthy of. And I think we have to trust the market uh, to deliver some of these uh, issues, and there will be some absolutely trusted organizations that people will be comfortable and going with. And, and Amazon and Facebook have been mentioned. And if people become sufficiently uncomfortable with a particular policy, then there's nothing wrong with someone having Facebook too or, or, or a competitor to Amazon to overcome those issues if it is genuinely a real problem. And if you don't like them, don't shop there. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd la la largely endorse that, and, and I think the, the, the key issue there is is liability, Louise. If, if, yeah. if, if something goes wrong, do, where do I get recourse from? And and, and 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 that seems to me, when all else is said and done, uh, is incredibly important for trust and for doing business on, on, on the internet. If something goes wrong, where can, where can I go to? And and some kind of attribute identities don't really provide that liability model. And indeed, we've talked a lot at the conference about the roles of Facebook and so on. They, they for all their strengths, are not actually in the business of managing that liability. That, that's not what they do. So I think constantly we have to bring ourselves back to, to the legal issues, to the liability issues, globally and locally. Okay. I think, Merza, you wanted to add to that. Yeah. Uh, I believe that there is still a balance required when you just say that the markets can decide and that once we have their organization and people based on their liking can do that but still a balance is required because sometimes things like what happened in 2008 is the financial collapse was again the same market was taking it in a certain direction and what happened in the dot-com days of the dot-com collapse when everything went on on to 
just leaving it to the market, then there is again a responsibility and accountability which has to be there by somebody somewhere who has to take on. The regulators have to be there and there should be somebody regulating the regulators. Mm. If you don't have them, then we still get can into... I, can I rudely interrupt on that? Because it was the regulators who arguably failed rather than the banks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see, exactly. Yeah. When you leave it to the market, that's what happens. <laughs> Because you're leaving it to the market, the regulators, I, what I just said was there has to be somebody on top of the regulators. Yeah. You require to have a framework. If you just leave it, then this is what happens. Then the banks can do the way they want to do it because the market is just being driven by money, profit. And if you leave it to be driven by profit, who's going to look after the real interest of humans? There's a big debate on that, obviously. I know a lot of people may not agree on that aspect. But we really require to do that. There has to be a balance in between. Do you, can you hear me? Yes, you need to keep it very close to your very mouth. Very close to my mouth. <laughs> well, I'm Thoris Pass. I'm from the Dutch delegation of the IGF. Um, and I've heard a lot of things about uh, an online passport or identity. Um, but I have several questions about those things. I heard the argument, uh, if, you, if you've got nothing to hide, uh, why wouldn't you get a passport? But I think a lot of students, at least, have a big problem with um, being monitored. Um, it, most of the people won't have a problem uh, when they have to buy something to show their identity or something, but they don't want to be monitored all the time. And I want to ask another question to the panel, um, because in real life, you have the right to be forgotten. Um, when you don't want something you have produced or anything else um, in the market anymore, you have the right to ask uh, to be, for example, a videotape or something, you can ask to take it out of the market. But on the internet, it's not possible. So what's your opinion on that? Okay. Andy. Um, interestingly, if you know my original email address, you will find emails I posted on the internet in 1986. Are they still there? They'll never be deleted. Um, and if you know my email addresses in between, you can actually see a history of me posting on the internet uh, for coming on 25 years. Um, there's no way of getting rid of them. Um, if you post stuff on the internet, it's there forever. It will get copied, it will get backed up. Um, so you try and delete it from one source, you'll find it on another source. You delete it from YouTube, it will show up on an equivalent in China, Russia, uh, any of the caching sites. You can't do it. Um, you have this problem that in the, in the real world, I mean, even in the real world, you cannot sometimes be forgotten. Once you are in a newspaper, once you are in a printed newspaper, <coughs> unless you're going to run around the country and collect up every edition of that newspaper, you're never going to be forgotten. You know, it's like saying to Richard, like Richard Branson turning around and saying, I want to be forgotten. It's never going to happen. Uh, that's the world we live in, and you're not going to change it. So you just need to be careful in the first place. I think we have another question just behind you. And there was a questioner over there, wasn't there? It's really yeah. just a quick sort of comment yeah. and your feedback. I mean, the enduring problem with this, with this issue of identity is the people that you want to be tracking and that do have something to hide will always be able to find a way technically to hide. And it's the students, the people who, who don't have anything to hide, who, who, you know, who will be the ones who will be trackable and who will be ideable. Uh, the Indian minister said something interesting uh, on, on day one. Um, he said of cybersecurity that it's not so much a maths problem but more a risk assessment issue. Uh, I sim simply agree with that, Kate, and, and, but, but would say that to some extent that there's a saying in English that, that uh, of finding a needle in a haystack. And if under some structure you can uh, align the vast, vast majority of bona fide wealth generating commercial transactions on the internet, um, that, that you, can, you can align them together, that they can take care of themselves, then actually it does give law enforcement a better opportunity 
to sift out the bad boys. So there, there, is, there is that to be said for it. Um, is, is this okay? Is it close enough? Okay. Um, I think this goes back into the discussion. Can you put it nearer to your mouth? And privacy Sorry. And identity. And I, I think it's important to also add into that discussion issues of proportionality and necessity. Um, for instance, uh, I work in India, and in India, for me to use a cyber cafe, I have to give my passport. I also have to fill out my name, my address, my gender, and my contact number, or my mobile number. They also can take a photograph of me. Often they have CCTVs in the, <laughs> in the cyber cafe, and then there's a log of my user activity on the computer, and this is all stored for a year. So my question is, where is the proportionality? I understand that law enforcement needs to access identity, but to what granularity and how do they go about doing this and um, what pressures do they put on different actors to collect this identity uh, for them? Okay. Um, yeah. um, can I give you a slightly different example which may highlight this? Um, around London, there are over 7,000 ca uh, CCTV cameras uh, that are run and monitored by different parts of the government. On top of that, you've got tens of thousands of CCTV cameras uh, put in by industries, business, uh, even private individuals. Um, nobody sits and watches all of that all the time. Um, they have 12 people looking after 7,500 cameras in London. They are not watching all 7,500 cameras. If something bad happens, they go find the tapes and they look. And that's pretty much what's happening with the internet and with the, the data capture on the internet. Nobody's looking at it. It's just too much of it. But if something bad happens, then they can go back and have a look at that tiny little bit that's relevant. And, and you've got to understand from a proportionality point of view, it's not that they're tracking everybody. It's that there's loads of big computer systems storing loads of data that could potentially track everybody. And as and when they need to, they go find the bit that's relevant. They don't have the resources to do it. And they also don't have the inclination to do it either. Thank you very much. I'm conscious that uh, we're running out of time. Um, there's a question that hasn't been discussed that I'd very much like to ask, and that was one of the questions that Mirza put to us, and that I think is a very important one. Um, how uh, can an internet identity framework, how can it become an e-business enabler for the masses in the East? Has anyone got some points to contribute on that? Because I think it's a very important question, and I would like to hear some contributions on that. Just, just put it very close to your mouth and speak loudly. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, if you speak loudly. All right. Uh, so I am from Qatar, so I'm already from the east. Right. And, uh, <laughs> uh, the main issue with e-business is that uh, it's two things. First of all, getting a credit card is actually uh, a pain. Like, it's not easy to get a credit card. You have to, have, uh, you have to be em already employed. So, and it takes uh, a while. And uh, the second issue is that people have a fear of uh, uh, getting their identities stolen uh, by hackers and all that. Because during the uh, late 90s, th there was a, a huge amount of uh, hackers and hackers uh, over the world. So, there is this culture that if you put your info there, if you try to sell and buy on the net, you'll get your ID sold. So, first we, we need to ease that fear. As second thing is, is that people are not inclined to share their uh, personal information with other people, with, uh, with the foreign uh, companies that they, that they can't see. So, 
I go to an online shop, if I don't know where this shop is located, or what, is, or who works there, then I'm not really inclined to trust them, unless they are as big as Amazon or something like that. Do you want to? He's just actually what you said is exactly what I was saying, the challenges in the East part. Now, how do we go around solving it? What can we do? Or There is a starting point, actually, which I came about to know from a company which started in UAE. The company is a Canadian company. They shifted their complete business model to the Arab world right now just because they identified a big gap. And they said there are too many blue-collared people who are working in the Arab world who are not even connected with any kind of internet identity or e-commerce or banks or so on. So what they did is they've started by putting uh, ATMs, specifically their own ATMs, around different organizations which have got a few thousand employees. And the salaries are going to be coming from the cards which will be issued to every single employee. Now those staff have started now having that identity. And not only that, the same card can be used anywhere across any of the countries because it's really a, a debit card, which can be used everywhere. Not only that, with that card being there, the same organization, which was not a bank but is now like, acting like a bank, they've started giving them microfinancing. So they, people can take loans, a small amount, because the salary is coming on the card and that automatically is being deducted in the same manner. So this is one model where they pulled in so many huge amount. And, oh, yeah, another great angle for all those people working in the Arab world was because this, there are two, all of these are expats coming in from different part of the world. All their money transfers can be also be done using the same card. So it suddenly gave them a lot of ease and also brought them on the Internet side, or let's say a digital side. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I am conscious of the time. I'd like to give the panel a chance for literally 30 seconds to raise other points or answer any other questions. John. Thank you, Lisa. I think literally 30 seconds. I've got here a letter dated July 1914. That's 98 years ago, which is a letter of introduction, actually by a bank in uh, Oklahoma on behalf of its client. So I. I guess the message I'm saying is that actually none of this is new. It's just that the medium is new, it's instantaneous, and it is ubiquitous. So um, on that note, thank you very much for, for listening to, 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 to us, and uh, um, I'll hand over to Andy. Um, I'm quite impressed on the amount of progress we've made in two years, and this was, this was something Ian picked up on. We've actually made a lot of progress in the last two years in, in defining what the problem is and coming up with some answers. But I think um, the balance, and it is a balancing act between security and privacy and openness, is going to remain emotive and it is going to remain very hard and we are just going to have to work. Uh, and I think the UN and UNIGF is a very good forum uh, to actually start this going. Yes, sir. I'll give up my 30 seconds for anybody else. I've already spoken enough. Anybody else wants to add any comments? Well, I'm going to use my 30 seconds just to follow on what um, uh, 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 Andy said. I think we've made a lot of progress. I know that there are still hands going up, and I haven't been able to ask everyone to speak. Um, uh, you can see up there that we've... Uh, got um, an email address that you can use if you'd like to join um, a, a dynamic coalition because we feel that uh, to make real progress people from across uh, the world who are involved in the Internet Governance Forum need to keep in touch um, between one IGF and the next. Just talking about it every year um, means that we're not making the progress as fast as we should. So we very much hope um, that there are people here who would like to join a dynamic coalition. If you would, please email to identity at bcs.org. 
to join the Dynamic Coalition and we'd very much like to uh, have your views and talk with you um, after this event. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation. Can I thank the panel for their contributions? Thank <clears throat> you.